Maggie starts off the article saying um, it's unlikely if you're reading this that it's the first time you've heard of the Barkley Marathons. And of course, you're probably watching this video. It's kind of the same. It's definitely been some of my biggest videos when I was covering the tweets of the event as much alive as possible. YouTube still doesn't let me go live completely, but uh, as always, you know, spoiler alert, the Barkley Marathons won again. And it said, you might say, why do people, she says, why do people keep doing this? No one has finished the race since 2017. And since its inception in 1986, only 15 people have ever finished. And for that matter, no woman has ever finished. Is this race just impossible at this point? And Maggie basically says that she believes it is possible. It's possible for me and any of the one of the ladies I was with on these two loops and many that weren't out there this year. At Barkley, there are things you can control and things you cannot. I always try to focus on the things you can control because doing anything else creates way too much anxiety. Way too much anxiety kind of sounds like my 2019. You would think it's 2020, but, you know, I was injured and then COVID. It didn't really create a lot of anxiety. But 2019, after quite a few years, almost a decade of enjoying tri enjoying triathlons, enjoying ultras, and having some success, the anxiety really got to me, and I definitely was not focusing on things that I can control. So the things she says, things you can't control. When the Barclay will start, what kind of weather will be, will we have, and what the course will be. How to deal with the things you can't control. And she basically says, and this is, goes for any kind of event, be ready for night or day start. Well, we don't have that. Most of us get to start when we want. You will have less than an hour to choose your gear. Be ready for all the seasons and all the weather, always. Study what you can and learn navigation. And yes, that is something that is unique with the Barclays. Is Usually it's a run around April Fool's time. This time it's a little earlier in March. But it's definitely the start. You don't know when it's going to be. It's always from a certain time. You know, It's always you know, from noon to midnight or something like that. But he can start anytime and often starts in the middle of the night which is what happened this year they started like at 3 a.m and so you hear the conk and you've got to get going i remember reading on one of the tweet reports that one woman missed the start because she was in a jeep sleeping away she says the jeep's got great sound dampening so that's definitely the case and then another athlete i remember actually left their bib so yeah you don't know when the thing's going to start which is unique to most events um you know so you're just laying there in bed i mean i know when I'm doing events, I you know, the morning races, you're just laying there waiting for the race to come. And it doesn't matter what the race is. Ever since I started racing and at 15 years old, you just feel that anxiety rising. And so that's definitely the case. And, you know, March, April, Frozen Head State Park. I mean, the name tells you it all, but it definitely any kind of weather can happen. They definitely have had some snow, cold conditions, wet conditions. This year, there were storms came in, made it a muddy mess. And um, then, of course, they were talking about the fog. And the fog is definitely disorientating, along with all those dang trees. I live in the East Coast, and so I know what those forests are like. My kids have lived here in Bakersfield, California, Central California, where I'm going to go out to Hart Park this afternoon, and there's not a tree within the whole, I don't know, four mile by four mile, 16 square miles, and there's not one tree, so you can see forever. And she says, things you can control. Your training, your nutrition, your mindset. Interestingly, she talks about her training. And in the article, she just says, in December, I got serious. She hit up her long-term coach, a long-time coach, and told her her goal. Same goal as they aimed for in 2018, 2019, and 2020, the Barclays Marathons. We managed, we mapped out a plan, balanced plan of strength work, speed work, and hill work. Followed it religiously. I put in the work. And so I'm not really sure what December she's referring to. Because it seemed like, I mean, I know she was had an injury issue after the big backyard. So, but I mean, if December, that didn't give you only a few months to uh, work on that thing. So, definitely interesting. Of course, this is on Tailwind uh, article. And she talks about that her nutrition really is helped by the Tailwind products. And she says that her solution was to make sure she was taking 1,400 to 18 calories worth endurance fuel per lap. Total calorie aim was 28 to 3,400 in hindsight, probably would have needed to up that for beyond three laps or more. So in her pack, she carried three 500 milliliter, milliliter flasks filled with endurance fuel. Back storage pocket, I had an additional two flasks with just the powder ready to go and then two extra sticks of endurance fuel should the opportunity arise to fill more flax. And yeah, you know, the Barclays doesn't have aid stations except they do, I've seen pictures, they do leave some one gallon jugs of water that you can fill up and i've seen in the past where those things have gotten frozen and so 
she said one of the things that really happens at Barclay, and then this kind of I thankfully I think is almost she says during Barclay time flies and it's easy to forget to eat or drink. I found that having liquor carlies allowed me to catch up faster if I forgot to eat and drink. And st- and on the second night in the cold rain and wind when our hands stopped working, I was grateful to just have to sit my calories and not have to try and tear open packets of food. I and others find that drinking all your calories in multi-day races, like I've done 48 hour up to six day numerous times, that drinking all your calories gets difficult after maybe 100 miles or 24 hours at a time. So it's interesting that she is able to drink a lot of her calories and tolerate it. And uh, yeah, it's definitely when things are miserable and cold, you definitely don't want to be taking your gloves off and trying to eat and, and you know trying to pay attention to where you're going. So I can definitely see that. It is interesting how many calories she definitely consumes in the race. Granted, I'm a big guy, 250 pounds. And so I often do long events and hardly eat at all. I, but I'm also just motor on at a pretty slow speed. But in this event, they're not moving very fast, but they are wasting a lot of energy um, in the conditions, the cold and the uh, tripping and falling and all that kind of thing. So I can see, I guess, you definitely burn more calories than you would say in uh, a, a, a flatter event. She goes on to talk about her mindset. This isn't learned in a day, but rather sets in over time as the training wears on me. For her, it was settling in since she started the whole journey in November 2017 when she began training for her first Barkley. She says she did let the anxiety of the unknown get to her the first year. So many unknowns. Each year, though, she says she's embraced the excitement of not knowing what the day will start and what sort of weather we'll have. She realized that it's what makes Barkley so unique and it's part of the challenge. And that's definitely the case. And it was interesting when I was following the Twitter reporting on it, how so many people, you know, were like, oh, the weather and this and that. And you're like, oh, it's Barkley. That's what you got to expect. The weather's going to be crazy. The time starts going to be crazy. You know, if you think you're going to go to Barkley and just have perfect conditions, you know, maybe that'll have a once in a blue moon. But then you wouldn't really even be getting the full experience. Maggie talks about the reward. She says, though she hasn't finished, the ultimate reward, she said, would definitely be that. But she says she learned a ton, pushed outside her comfort zone, and got to share the course with some amazing athletes over the years. This year was no different. She shared the course with some badass ladies, according to Walter. First time a virgin, as they call it, Liz Canty. Second time, first was in 2018. And not a lady, Jamil Curry, over 16 cumulative Barkley laps to his name. And I'm sure it was probably very helpful to have Jamil out there with them since he's been out there many, many times. And I'm sure that he was really liked having them with him. Um, she has another section says, what actually happened out there? She said that, you know, they can make lots of excuses for the weather for sure. And for the slower times, even being issued a metal pocket watch as the only option to tell time with also contributed a small way. But the reality is there's always something. We were just cruising, not making too many big mistakes. Eventually on the second night, on the second loop with only one major climb to go they made a huge navigational mistake in the fog got off course which cost them time to get to the cutoff in 2640 they rolled in a camp tagged the yellow gate 12 minutes over the time and that ended their journey and they were not able to complete the loop three you know barkley does not allow any kind of electronic devices on there which wow it'd be difficult being out there and not having any music or podcast or something to listen to of course i guess you just need to concentrate but music makes me focus and concentrate whenever i'm in a multi-day race and i really what I'll do is I'll just kind of be in sleep mode and just kind of walk along, get the laps in. And then I can kind of feel it building like, okay, you're starting to feel better, better, better. And then I put the music on and it just kind of, I listen like above and beyond and uh, uh, that EDM electronic music. And then all of a sudden I'll just rip off a couple hours of really great laps. So that would be something, I mean, I guess, you know, you got to, it's also, but when you're navigating, it is nice to hear your surroundings and just kind of get some bearing, especially in the dark, you know, you kind of have your, bring out your inner bat but I definitely didn't really think about this until I read it again. It says metal pocket watch. I thought he did. He, in the past, he's given them crappy little Casio watches. So a pocket watch makes it even more difficult. And I wonder if he gave it to them uh, before the, you know, like when they were before when they got to the race or they gave it to him, you know, right before, you know, the hour before. Because a metal pocket watch would be a pain in the butt because you dang, you dang sure don't want to lose it. But then where do you put it? And then when you ever want to check the time, you're going to have to find it on your packs or, yeah, because you can't just have it on your wrist. So that's very interesting. I didn't realize, I didn't, I didn't really realize that it was a, 
I knew they gave him an old school watch, but a metal pocket watch would definitely be difficult. Plus, the dang thing's going to be slippery, and you got the gloves on and trying to look at it. That could definitely that definitely screws up your game. That was Maggie's part of this article, and then Tailwind also interviewed the three ladies who were all sponsored by Tailwind, Liz, Courtney, and Maggie, and asked them some questions. I'm going to go through the questions and answers a little bit here. It says, Tailwind says, what were your most nervous about going into Barclay? And Liz said, as I think everyone says, navigation, more confident in 2018, but being away from the course for three years is stressful. Luckily, I live only a few hours away, so getting familiar with the trail landmarks and general features of Frozen Head was easy. But I barely remember book locations from my first time. Looking forward to 2022 and all the extra notes I've written. And yeah, that is true since, you know, they didn't have the race last year. It's been a while, even for the veterans. And then, of course, if you, yeah, it, it, you know, having some local knowledge would definitely be helpful. Courtney was interesting. She said, copying the map and doing the pre-race bearings. I didn't know what the process would look like and pictured a high-stress environment. Of people scrambling to get their maps prepared before the race started. It turned out not to be so intense, and I was lucky to have Maggie there to help with the process. And, man, I'd be terrible at that map drawing because I've got terrible handwriting. I have this uh, notebook I have here, and I write notes like when I'm doing interviews, the gesture and stuff, but it looks like doctor's <laughs> prescription writing. Sometimes I look down and go, what the heck did I write? Now, I've always had bad handwriting, but then I broke my hand playing baseball long ago, and so I could totally – the map drawing would definitely be – and you also stress me, like, uh, you know, like how much time do you got to get? So, And then Maggie said – she said, a lot less than previous years, but I would say it's always the navigation. Would I remember things from previous years? Would things look familiar? Do I know enough? The answer to that is no. Navigation will be something I'm going to focus on this year. And that definitely, I would highly recommend doing one of these orientation classes. We have them up here in Bakersfield above in the mountains in Pinos. They have orienteering classes. And a friend of mine, Sarah, and I went up and did it. It was nice just to use those maps of course those are topographic maps but you could look at his map i don't know how detailed they are i'm sure you could probably google it and see a photo i bet someone snuck that out or at least see people's maps that they draw but it definitely helps to get your bearings i think you're also depending on where you grow up like i said i grew up in the east coast with forest and so i know my navigation skills are way better than my friends live here out west where there's not a whole lot of trees Taylor and also asks, was everything what you expected or were there any surprises? Was anything harder or easier to manage than you thought it would be? Liz said she knew the weather was coming and knew some of the newer course hills were going to be killer. I can honestly say I wasn't surprised about how tough the laps were, though they were even tougher when you left out Laz's expected directions to wander about. So she basically, like I said, every year he changes up the course and he threw in extra hills. And, and like she said, once you veer off that course, you're in trouble. And I mean, I know that just in some small races I've done, you know, you just lose a little bit and it's all she wrote. Courtney said she was surprised about how much fun she had on the course. She knew it was going to be hard and that adding navigation to the mix makes for more mental strain than normal. So she expected to just be suffering the whole time. Instead, she said, we are laughing a lot as we slid around in the mud and found books under random rocks. And I can completely believe that. I've been at Desert Solstice and watched her run around for 24 hours. So I her set an American record at Modesto in the 24 hour race and she always has that amazing smile and always seems to be having fun out there even though you know she's suffering and I've seen her at Tahoe so I can totally see her and then if you've ever seen Courtney and Maggie together on any kind of videos and stuff they just have a great uh, chemistry I remember her Maggie Sally uh, McRae and uh, Zach Bitter's wife um, they all Nicole they were all commentating when Zach was running his 100 miler on the treadmill in his house and they were it was just a great uh, great great show what made the show even more entertaining was burt kreischer came in and burt kreischer of course is a big guy on joe rogan and he also runs marathons and he came on the show and it was just amazing and the chemistry that the the women had meshed so well with burt they were trying to talk burt into doing a 100 mile race and so i can definitely see that courtney had fun maggie says the hills felt more manageable in the path then in the past years, which just proves that her training was going well, she said she had more in the tank when she finished. And, and she said, I've been in the fog there before, but underestimated how hard it is to fall a simple ridge when the visibility is 10 feet. I was not prepared to know what to do in that situation when we got off course. 
cold and probably lack of sleep played into bad decisions, which just reinforces that you have to know ahead of time what to do. They say the fog is your biggest enemy at Berkeley, and I underestimated it. Here in Bakersfield, California, we used to have fogs. I moved here in the late 70s, and we had in our school year 10 fog days built into the schedule and so you would wake up and yes kids you didn't go on the internet so you turned on the radio and they would say the following school districts are closed and you'd hear yours and you'd be like yes school doesn't start till 10 o'clock and the thing would be though is you look at your front yard and you couldn't see across the street dense fog called the Thule fog made driving incredibly dangerous and navigating and i remember you know like i'm going to go out to hart park and hike i remember even without trees out there friends of mine would get lost because you just have no idea where you are add in second night not in any sleep and you definitely can and the conditions you can definitely lose a lot a lot of time uh tailwind asks what would you do differently next time and uh it's kind of interesting liz said uh have more tailwind on her it sounds like she had to borrow some from maggie because she got a cramp at the at jaw with no salt tablets and the extra tail went and helped her up. And she says she was confident in her training, but she would wish she'd worked on more compass bearing and had them on a page in my wrist and not on a map and better compass setup. Kept getting frustrated with it around my neck. Yeah, two summers ago, we went out and did that orientating uh, class. And yeah, using a compass, even though I've used them in the past, it's not that easy. And uh, definitely be, uh, you know, having around your neck, or be worried about it getting caught on things. And so again, you're kind of like, you got this pocket watch you got to have somewhere. You've got this compass somewhere. You don't want to lose either one of them. So I could definitely see that would be difficult. Courtney says, choosing one thing is hard. A different pair of gloves and one more layer would have been great. Also learned about a lot about the type of navigation required for this challenge and could prepare more specifically for that. And I bet you she will. I bet you before she goes back there, she's definitely going to research and figure out how to navigate better. Maggie said, I will never be that person that goes out there without the right gear again. A few times during the second night, I got really worried that hyperthermia would do me and everyone else in and that we would have to actually take Quitter's road back to camp, except for maybe Liz, who wore a maroon uh, wool shirt. Good job, Alabama. Also more navigation practice. And yeah, I emphasize that all the time. It's amazing how the uh, cold monster can grab you. I've been at many a looped race and, you know, the darkness falls and it might be just a one mile loop. And, you know, you walk past your aid station car set up and you get a hundred, couple hundred yards away or halfway along. And all of a sudden you didn't get into warm clothes. Maybe you're a little bit wet and man, that half mile can really mess with you. And by the time you get back to your vehicle, you got to get in the vehicle and turn it on. So I can't imagine what it is like to be out there in the woods, not knowing where you are without the extra gear and i would definitely think it would be interesting they definitely think they would should carry more gear you know go out there definitely with everything you need because you're better safe than sorry i've kind of learned that lesson of course being a big guy at 250 pounds i really don't need to be worrying about you know shedding an extra pound on my pack and i used to do that with water i used to go out and do crazy hikes and adventures without a lot of water and now i'm like you know what i'm too old for this shit i've got to bring be more prepared and uh but you know you screw up uh, just a few weeks ago i think i'm going out to Hard park today with my friend amanda and we were out there a couple weeks ago and bakersfield has no weather generally it gets five six inches of rain but we were out there it had rained earlier in the day and it's supposed to rain later we get there bright sunny day we hike out we're only a couple well we're about, place isn't big we were about two miles from the car about as far away as we could black clouds came in pelting rain freezing cold and of course neither of us had a jacket because we're like ah it's you know march we'll be okay and i've never been more cold ever than than white that day so it's definitely something you got to prepare for um they also ask him what was your most memorable moment out there liz says as much as i want to say it was me falling off a cliff i was incredibly proud that we all made the choice together to finish off our loop even knowing we would most likely be out of time there's an easier on the trail route we could have made back to camp but we pushed onward to the last book and finished this an almost complete team sharing headlamp light and courtney said spending 27 hours with a small group of fantastic people in less than ideal conditions was really cool i remember how positive our group stayed and how well we meshed and i definitely remember how funny it was watching us fall a million times as we went down the muddy hills and claw our way up steep pitches oh, i just i can't imagine too bad jamil didn't have his drones and his cameras out there it would definitely be fun but then that would destroy a lot of the mystique of the race and closing out this article 
that I will have in, in the show notes the from Tailwind Nutrition. And thank you for them posting this and Maggie writing it and them doing the interview. Maggie says, 100% sharing times with friends and witnessing all the ridiculous ways we fell down the mud. Off cliffs, yes, Liz, 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 and got tangled up in trees. I mean, this race is so absurd. You really just have to laugh sometimes. I also love getting to be getting to be there for my friend Courtney's first Barkley attempt and watching her just crush those hills. Excited for all three of us to make another go someday again. And I know myself, I'm definitely looking forward to watching them. Or I don't get to really watch them. I, get, I can refresh my Twitter feed, and I'm really rooting for them. I think that the two of them are just amazing, and I think someday they will definitely be the first women to finish Barclays. And as always, stay healthy, be boring.